Good morning, guys. So today, as, as promised to you, so we're going to talk about um, everything that is related to co-integration, okay? So this is going to be the, at least the, the theoretical part of the class that we're going to finish next, next Tuesday. Okay, let's understand what co-integration means. Let's do some, let's present some intuition first. Now, what we have been seeing up to now, guys, with the models that we have been working are the, you know, perhaps the ARMA type model, not the ARMA PQ model. We have talked also about the GARCH or ARCH type models. Now we have talked also about the multivariate version of this, the VARP model. No? So all of these models here by construction, they require, so they require stationarity of the data. The data must be stationary. Okay, and the way we prove this or the, the way we check this was first of all, we can take a look to the autocorrelation, partial autocorrelation function, and then try to see how the variable behaves. If this behaves like a, a R1, but a very consistent R1, so the, the ACF basically stays around one for a long, long period, this is one way of seeing that the data is non stationary. Uh, last class, what we did is we take a look, we took a look to uh, to something that we call the, the Dickey Fuller test. And just let's talk a little more about the Dickey Fuller test. And remember, the null hypothesis of the Dickey Fuller is always going to be there is a unit root test. Okay. Or basically, the series are non stationary. So this is the the null hypothesis. Okay, and we have seen that there are three versions of the Dickey Fuller. Basically, we said always my H0 is going to be that yt equals yt minus one plus an error. So this is basically here what I am assuming is that psi <coughs> equals one <coughs> versus different versions of, of alternative hypothesis. So we have the first one is simply psi yt minus one plus mu t. Here, what we believe is that psi is smaller than one in absolute values. It's a stationary process. So this is the, the first uh, Dickey Fuller test. Then we have the second, as I mentioned to you, this is exactly the same always. And the second one, the, the alternative for the second method is going to be that I believe that it is, oh, sorry, psi plus ut minus one plus ut. So this is, um, Stationary with drift. Okay. With drift. And finally, the, the last and more complete version of the test is going to be drift and trend. So this again continues being the same. And my alternative now is going to be mu, that is my constant, my drift, plus psi yt minus one, plus let's call it beta t plus my error. So this represents my drift, and this represents my trend. So these are the, the three versions of the, of the Dickey Fuller. And before moving to something else, there was a, there is a, 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 a kind of an issue and a problem given the assumption of the error. So remember what we believe is that these guys are zero mean a white noise process. And remember by definition, the white noise process, the covariance of errors in different periods of time must be equal to zero, right? For all J different uh, to zero. So this is one of the assumptions that is very, very strong, but in real data, however, we can find uh, that the errors are autocorrelated. So we need to do, or we need to find a way of how to remove the possible autocorrelation that appears here. And this is what is called, what well, we don't need to do it, it has been done already. It's called the augmented Dickey Fuller. Okay, or the famous test that is named simply ADF, okay. So the Menti Dickey Fuller guys works from the following. So let's start with the, the null hypothesis. Okay, my null hypothesis is this one. 
No, and, and indeed, if I put rho here, my null hypothesis here is basically, I believe that this is one. So unit root means non-stationarity. Now that the trick that it is normally done is I, I will subtract y t minus one in both sides of the equation. And then I will have psi y t minus one minus y t minus one a plus u t. So this one here is a change on y t. And this one here, I will collect that the terms is going to be psi minus one y t minus one plus u t. And now this variable here, we call cap psi, okay? y t minus one plus u t. And so what is, what is the, the interesting notation here is that now my null hypothesis is remember that if psi equals one, so this implies that one minus one zero. So my null hypothesis here is simply going to be that this one here is zero. So the, the traditional null hypothesis of significance, okay? So we take the first difference of yt, uh, no, and we try to be, to check what is the relationship with yt minus one. If we check that this psi equals zero, so this implies that it's non-stationary, okay? And remember that psi equals zero indeed implies that small psi equals one, okay? Just take a look here. So if this is cap psi, if a small psi is one, one minus one is zero. So this is the relationship here, okay? Now, what Dicky fuller did, the domain Dicky fuller is simply trying to remove all potential autocorrelations of UT. So how, how this is done with a very simple trick. So we copy again, this one here. And then I simply start lagging let's say m of yt minus i plus ut. So basically what we do is we, instead of running versus t minus one, uh, we run versus the lags of the changes of yt. How many, this is what we need to determine. And normally the, the way we determine this one is using a criteria, um, information criteria that we already know. Now, uh, the Kaike, the, the Bayesian, the Hana Queen, right? So we can use, either of these, but also what is really important is knowing the frequency of the data. So if you know by frequency, so you can select also the number of lags by knowing the frequency of your data. As, as normally guys, if we work with daily data, no, the, what is normally recommended is five. So five lags, five days. Normally the, you, the memory has, the, the model has a memory of one week. If we're using monthly data, no, Normally the number of lags is 12. And if we are using, for example, quarterly data, the recommended number of, of lags can be four. Okay? So it depends on, on the type of data, it depends on the frequency, but you can also use the Kaike variation and, and Hanan Queen. Now, this is really important that the, the way you determine this, this one here is very, very important because if you include more, if you include more uh, lags than necessary, what is gonna be happening is, is that your test is going to be creating a, an MA process that is non-invertible. Uh, okay, so that's that's terrible. I will show you one example in a couple of minutes. And if you use less lags than needed, so this one is going to be autocorrelated. So this is also bad. Okay, so you need to be kind of precise on selecting the number of lags. Now, uh, lucky you that EVUs, for example, or even R or, or Python, they already have automatic automatic uh, processes that determine which one is the best lag. Okay, we're going to see that uh, perhaps later. Now let's go into, into something more. So this is my augmented DK fueler. Remember, we are going to be using the augmented DK fueler quite frequently. Oops. Okay. Let's go to something more. Let me go now. Okay. So what is, what, what is the issue of using a uh, bar type models or in general, any type of models that have a stationarity of data? So you know what, uh, if we have an station, uh, a model that has a stationary variable, so for example, the first derivative, the first I differentiate once of yt, and then I simply run a model beta zero plus beta one change on xt plus my error, okay? So this is the, the typical models or that we have been working. This can be a bar, uh, sorry, an R model. We can have a multivariate version of this, like a bar model, etc. But what is important here is that this relationship is only for a short term, okay? And, and so 
in order to understand this, remember how in economy we define the long term. When we talk about long term, we normally refer as an equilibrium situation. Now, what is an equilibrium situation? It's basically a situation in which yt equals yt minus one equals yt minus two, etc. So it's a situation, it's a status quo. The, the, the variables not, do not change anymore. The same happens with xt. So xt is going to be xt minus one, is going to be xt minus two, etc. Okay? So it's, a, it's an state in which the variables don't change. And what happens in, in this model one, if this happens, when I arrive to an equilibrium, so you, you can realize what is the change of y is simply yt minus yt minus one equals beta zero plus beta one xt minus xt minus one plus ut. So if we apply this in equilibrium, so this part disappears, this part disappears, at the end, at the end of the day, you have nothing. So that's why these models, models of this form that we have been working up to now are only good for representing short-term relationships. They have nothing to say about long-term relationship, okay? So these models here are not able to tell us a long-term relationship. Of course, if it exists, no? Uh, okay, so how do we do that? How do we start understanding that the long-term relationship? Uh, and for that, let's take a look to for some notation, okay? Let's take a look to what do we understand from a couple of things. So what I will say is that if yt is a series, okay, okay, and, and yt, I will say is integrated of degree d. Got it? So what is what is this integrated of degree a one, a degree d? So imagine that yt, okay, this is an example, is integrated of degree one. So what is this one here? This means that in order to make yt, in order to make this yt an stationary process, what I need to do is I need to differentiate once. Okay? So in general, how many times I need to differentiate a variable that is integrated degree d? Well, I need to differentiate d times. So if it's an i2, I need to take first derivative, second derivative. Okay, or differentiate first and then take a second differentiation. And that's the way uh, this notation works. So in, in, in economics, in general, we are going to be working normally with I1s. So what we have been seeing up to now, when we don't see an stationary series, we take the difference. And once we take the difference, we, we become from I1, or the series become from I1, it comes to an I0. Okay, and then we solve the problem, so done. So we can, we can move from there. Now, uh, in general, there is a, um, okay, this definition here is crucial to understand. Let's take a look to the type of uh, non-stationarities. And this is going to be crucial, okay, because we can, normally the people can make a lot of mistakes just for misunderstanding or misusing uh, some techniques here. So we have one, and I will just mention this one here, that you have the data that looks like this. Um, obviously, this one here is not a stationary process. Remember that the easy trick, just take an interval, take another interval in time. The, the only condition is that the interval size is exactly the same. I just compute the mean. So perhaps that the mean here is going to be around, okay, let's say this is 10, this is 20, this is 30, etc. And then perhaps the mean of the other guy it's going to be around 30. So they are non-stationary by, by, by construction. Okay, but what you can observe here also is that there is a trend here. You see that? Okay, and, and the trend, well, how, how do we deal with these ones here? Well, first of all, this one here is called a trend stationary process. Why is it called trend stationary process? Because what you need to do guys is detrend the series. So if you, if you detrend the series, what, the resulting series is going to be in a stationary way. Okay, so what is the meaning of that? How do I detrend a series? The, it's, it's very simple. Indeed, the model that you use is the following. So imagine that this is your yt process. Okay, so what you do is your yt, you can run this against a constant, plus the time, plus my error. Okay, so t is simply a number that goes from one to n, 
this number of uh, simply one, two, three, four, five, it represents time. You run this regression, okay? And, and remember, what is UT? UT here is going to be, if I, I estimate this one here, it's going to be simply YT minus beta zero estimated minus beta one estimated times T. Do you see? So basically what, what, what I'm doing is I'm removing from my variable from YT, I'm removing first the, the Y intercept. So this is going to be centered around zero, but I am also removing the, the trend. So basically what we are doing technically guys is a series that is like that by doing this one here and using now UT, that is my, my D trended series that is supposed to be a stationary series. What we are doing is we're moving simply my, my line that is this black one here, you're going to be moving this into down. And so you're going to be creating, so it's going to be that the mirror image, okay? But now it's going to be simply detrended, right? So just to take a look to this and, and understand better. So I have prepared a small Excel, a toy example, just to show you how this works. Okay, so this is my data. This is my Y and, and this is my time. If you see the, the data guys, Y and so this is my time, this is my Y. So you see here, my Y appears to be trending. So it's non-stationary, but you can see that there is a trend here that can help us understand, oh, you know what? I have a trend. Uh, if I take, if I remove simply the, the, the trend here, what I can have is a stationary process. So what I do is I create, this is, okay, this is my data. I create T. Remember T is, I told you it's time. I, I just write one, two, three, four, five. In this case, I have 50 observations. And then I simply run my regression. So my regression is going to be it's here. It's going to go as usual in Excel, data, data analysis, regression, click on regression. And then you enter your Y variable. My Y variable is this one here. Enter your uh, X variable. In this case, my X variable is T. Uh, is this one here? And then you simply put labels, a set output range. I want to put this in E1, and then you simply run. And what is interesting from this regression, guys, uh, what, what I've done? Oh, I, yeah, I don't want to do this. I run my, my regression here. Uh, let me see what's, what happened. Okay. In any case, so I have my feet. Let me see if my feet is correct. Okay. So my feet is going to be as usual. I multiply simply my, oh, I know what, what happened. So you can move here. You can move. So my receipt, my, my feet is going to be this one. And this one should go here. And then I simply copy this one. Okay, here we are. Okay, here we are. Uh, what happens is that um, I have my, my variable. So this one here is the, the y-intercept. I put a four just to fix it. Plus my t, my beta, fix it times p2. Uh, sorry, yes, b2, etc. Then you run. And what is my residual? The residual is simply my y and my feet. You see, this one minus my feet is my residual. Then if you take a look to what happens, so this is my original data. So let's perhaps introduce here again, my right click at a trend line, just to show you the trend. Okay, so this is the trend, the original trend. So let's do more right. And perhaps you can go like that. So this is my original trend. Now let's take a look to the trend here. Uh, I will again right click a trend line and I will just draw this perhaps as a, as a green and let's do like this. You see? So that's what, what you have done. You have detrend the series. But if you take a look to the series, the series look very similar to each other. The only thing that you have done is remove the, the, the trend. And now what you do next. This one here, well, it doesn't, my, my graph is not too good and my data is created artificially, so it doesn't look too good. But this one here, the probabilities of this one here being um, non, uh, sorry, being stationary are, are more high, are higher than this one here. Okay? So this is what is called detrending. You have this Excel file with you too, so you can take a look and play with this, this one here. Uh, let's continue. 
So this is the first the first type of non-stationarity. The first type of non-stationarity is something that's called a trend stationary. And uh, what what is next now is what is called the stochastic non-stationarity. And this one here is the one that normally we are going to be finding in the in the data, guys. Okay? So what is a an stochastic non-stationarity? Basically, an stochastic non-stationarity, guys, if you remember is P500, perhaps, or any price series, they, they look like that, you know, something like that. Obviously, non-stationary, but you don't see a trend also here. It's not a clear trend here. So how's the solution with this one here? Well, you differentiate a series. When you differentiate a series, guys, what you are doing is you are doing this stuff. If I differentiate one and then I get an I zero, so you have already an stationary process, but sometimes you need to differentiate more than once. And so you're going up to your right until you arrive to I zero, and then you have your stationary series. Okay. So the solution for this one here for trend stationary is the trending. For this one here, you take the difference. So I will say D times, okay, where D means simply how many, what is that, the integration number. And then the integrating D times or differentiating, sorry, D times you get an I zero. And remember an I zero is what we call um, an stationary process, okay? So I zero is what is called an stationary process. And, and this is what we want. We want a stationary process. Now, extremely careful here, guys, that if you know that you have trend stationarity and then you, you apply a differentiation, you differentiate a series when you don't need to do that, you're going to be Create a, a very significant problem. So let me let me do that. Let's assume the following. Let's assume, okay, the series follow. Uh, okay, so let's call it beta zero. So they are trend stationary plus beta one plus ut, right? And so you say, you know what? Instead of uh, taking the um, instead of simply using this regression and then using ut as my new variable, you said what I want to do is I want to take a difference of this one here. Okay, so if I do yt minus one is beta zero, beta one t minus one plus mu t minus one. Okay, so I subtract this one here. Beta, beta zero disappears. And here we, are, we have this beta one t minus beta one t minus one plus u t minus u t minus one. And then this is change of yt equals uh, beta t uh, with this beta t disappears. Do you agree? Then basically what I'm, I'm left here is a minus is you, you're left with beta one plus ut minus ut minus one. Do you remember what process is this one here? This is an MA1 process, correct? Remember that MA1 process just just to refresh your memory, is simply yt in general equals mu plus ut plus uh, we use, I think, theta. Yeah. Theta. Let me do this one. Plus theta one ut minus one. Okay. And the only, the only thing that you see here, guys, is by construction in this model. What we are doing is we are fixing this one to be one. What is the problem when we have this theta one equal one, guys? The MA process is not invertible. When theta equals one, when theta one equals one, MA is not invertible. So what is the, 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 the intuition of that? Is that basically you don't have you have an explosive process, okay? Or like like a type of a I1, uh, sorry, a unit booth in the in the R1. So you have a process that is not well behaved. So basically your result here, when you try to do a model here, you try to model this one with the techniques that we have learned up to now. So you want to have, you know, perhaps you're never gonna arrive to a, to a solution or your solution is going to be completely biased and inefficient, right? So just be careful on the type of identifying the type of uh, <clears throat> non stationary that you have. And then you need to be sure that you apply the correct technique to, uh, to make it stationary. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So let me see. Now, what do we understand by long-term relationship? 
What is a long-term relationship? Okay, and then what is interesting, what is interesting here, guys, is that not everything that commutes is necessary or has necessary long-term relationship. So what I mean from that is that imagine that you have these two series completely independent, okay? You know, they were created completely independently. Okay, and perhaps this one here. Now, if you see these two series, guys, Obviously, if you run the regression on one on the other one, you're going to have the R square is going to be fantastically high. And also the coefficients are going to be significant. Agree? So, but the thing is that, what is the relationship? What, what is that? This can be, uh, I don't know, rain in Peru. And, and this one can be whatever, you know, uh, stock market going up, stock prices, stock prices of a completely unrelated stock. You know, you know, and perhaps you, you can see this one here, you can have a beautiful R square and all the coefficients are going to be significant. But the intuition guys is that rain in Peru has anything with top prices uh, with IBM. So I, I will exaggerate Amazon. Uh, so you, you see that there is something that is not, not, going, not going on here, okay? When we refer a long-term relationship guys, we need to have a, a clear, idea, we need to have some background here. So we need to have some theoretical background, for example. Okay, and, and mathematical background, of course. But what I mean for this one here, several examples of things that you can imagine, they need to relate in the future, even though in a, in a short term, they're not heavily related, okay? Or perhaps they, they seem not related. For example, if you talk about option, option prices, Okay, and option prices, remember guys, always have an underlying stock. Okay, can be currency, can be interest rates, but it has an underlying, let's say, stock. Okay, and it's linked to the price of the stock, to the volatility of the stock, etc. So, what you can imagine that if there is a price discrepancy between uh, today, between the option price and the underlying price of the stock, yeah, perhaps yes, can exist in the short term. But what you cannot imagine is that the option price is going to move in one direction while the, the stock price is going to be moving in a complete opposite direction. Right? So there, is a, there must be a force that links these two guys in time. Okay, So this one here, for example, <coughs> should have a, a, a clear long-term relationship. Another, another thing that it is very common, guys, is that normally the, the people say, okay, what is the price of the stock today? What is the fundamental price of the stock today? The tons of analysis, fundamental analysis, technical analysis, et cetera. But there are some, some uh, people that believe that, you know what, if you buy one stock and you're not going to sell this forever, so what is the only source of, of uh, income for you? Dividends, okay? So this is, if you are gonna keep the stock in the corporation forever, how do you get money from the corporations? Basically through dividends. So that's why what the, the people say, the price of an, an asset I should be simply the discounted values. Okay, so let's do the sum of a dividends at time I from I equal one to N discounted one plus R. Sorry, one uh, I is not a good idea, J. Let's do J here, one plus I uh, to the J. Right? So you, what you do is you simply discount all the future cash flows so imagine that you are here and you want to receive one cash flow, one cash flow, another dividend, another dividend, another dividend, another dividend, and then from time, and this continues eternally. So what you do is you simply move or uh, you know, present value of all the, all the future values to the present. And the sum of all these ones here should be equal to the price. Right? So that's why what the people start arguing. So if this price here depends on the dividends, and if you, and then you, you can compute this at any time in at any period in time. So you perhaps have your value according to this model. The P should be like that. You agree? Yeah, because they they start they believe that they're they're startups, so the, the dividends are very small. But as soon as they start maturing, the dividends start getting better, etc. Okay, so you can have a, a kind of a dividend-based pricing. And then what you need to see, for example, and you what you can see is you you argue well. Yeah, perhaps this price is not the right price is because, because this depends only on the assumption that I will just charge, I will just have an income from dividend. But my price in any case, you know, should be, should be around here. What I don't expect 
is uh, that my model with dividends tells me that the black one and the prices here are, are like that. Okay, there, are, there, there is a problem. Where? That's where you need to analyze. It is driven by the market. There is a, a bubble here in the market, or it is something that the fundamental, the, the technical guys are seeing that you are not seeing, or perhaps the expectations dividends are going to be higher than expected. The business is doing much better than expected, etc. But in any case, the relationship between the dividends and the prices, you know, or the discounted dividends that estimate the, uh, an estimation of the prices with the prices observed in the market, they also need to have a relationship in time. You, what you expect is more the type of relationship between the black and the red. Yeah. And, and so you, you can have guys, are all, a lot of examples in, um, in, uh, in, in, in economics, guys. For example, another one that is, that is critical and we use a lot is that if you have a spot price and then you have a future price on the same, let's say in the same stock, they must be related somehow, okay? The spot price should be, if this is my spot price, this is my future price, okay? So if this is my C0, this is my CN, there should be a way in which I can move my C0 to CN, or I can move my CN to my C0, but they must be related. They cannot be completely independent. So CN cannot have, cannot be an independent number, and C0 also cannot be an independent number because they are related. We're talking about the same stock in different periods of time. So there must be a relationship, right? So, but this relationship, this long-term relationship comes from theory, comes from understanding economics and finance. And, and you are not going to be you know, involved in this type of, of, of regressions. And, and these ones here are called spurious regressions. Okay. Yeah, the R squares are beautiful, the coefficients are all significant, but what is the economic intuition of the relationship or causality or correlation between these guys here? No one knows. You know, you were very lucky. And if you want to forecast just the rain, if it's gonna rain more in Peru, it's gonna have some prices go up, you're gonna see that this is gonna be catastrophic. Next sense. What else? Yes, okay. So given this background, guys, I think that we are in capacity to go to co-integration. Okay, so let's understand co-integration in a, in a very simple way, Mathematical, mathematically a very simple way. Let's take a look to what happens. Uh, let's assume guys that I have uh, several variables X, okay, series X1, two, X to T, etc., And I have X, let's say KT. Okay, so I have K variables X series, okay? And assume that every one of them, it is D1, this is integrated of D2, this is integrated of degree three, uh, degree K, okay? So everyone can have, you know, D1, D2, D K can be different, they can be equal, but in general, the, the, all the Ds are different from zero. So they are from one up, right? So let's define a variable, let's call it CT. And CT simply is going to be, guys, as a linear relationship from I to K, alpha I of X I T. So simply this one here is what is called a linear combination. Okay, so simply you find an alpha, okay? And this alpha you multiply by x1, t, x2, et cetera. And then you create a variable ct. Now, what is interesting guys comes from the following tree. So let me do it. So if I do ct, I will take the first one here. So I will take alpha one, x1, t. So basically what is left is going to be from i equal two to k of a alpha i, X I T, you see? Now what I will do is I will move, I will keep here this and I will move to the other one. I will have a alpha one X one T equals a C T minus sum of alpha I X one T, okay, I equals two, okay. I will divide everything by, 
I will divide everything by the, uh, the alpha one, and I will move this to the other side. X one T is going to be equal to minus sum of alpha I alpha one uh, X one T plus C T divided by alpha one. Okay, and I will call this uh, a positive number. I'm doing this correct. Okay, so let me see. This is this. This goes to the other side. Yes, perfect. So now what I will, I will what I will do is okay. This is going to be x one t equals. Okay, uh, I will just call this sum of beta i x one t plus you know z t prime. Okay, z t prime is not transpose. It's simply a different name for this one here. So beta one is going to be equal to minus this one. And, and C prime T is simply the original C T divided by alpha one, right? Now pay special attention here, guys, to this equation here. This equation here looks like a regular regression. This is like a regular regression. When Z T prime is simply my, my errors. Do you see? So what we have done is we have expressed this linear combination as a simple regression, where C T prime is simply my errors. Okay? Now, what is interesting, guys, is that in general, when you have the linear combination of ID variables, C T is going to be also an integrated of maximum of D I. So imagine if D K is 10, and this is the maximum D, that exists between D1 and DK. So your C is going to be integrated of degree 10. Okay, so this is by construction. So of course, if CT has very undesirable properties, so we cannot do anything. Okay, so there is no long-term relationship, etc. However, what can happen is take a look to this, this regression. However, what we can what, what can happen, <clears throat> and this was Granger observation and down in, back in the 80s. Basically, take a look to this one here, a common OLS regression, for example, mass meeting, okay, plus meeting. Now, what I can do is I can write and assume that all these guys, okay, I will just focus my attention on, on ID, on I1 series, that this, this is what normally we have in, in economics. So X1 is ID, X2 is, is sorry, is I integrated for A1 and X, T is also integrated over one. Now, what happens if I write this regression in the following way? Minus beta zero, minus beta one, X one T, minus beta two, X two T equals UT. Now, what you can see here, guys, this is simply a linear combination of variables Y, X one, and X two. What is my, my vector of my, what is my linear combination vector? It's going to be one, minus beta zero, minus beta one, uh, minus beta two. So this one here is my linear combination vector. Okay. My linear combination vector is simply, you know, it's weights that you put to everyone, you standardize on, on Y and, and that's it. What is really interesting and the proof of, of, of stationarity guys, is the following, uh, sorry, of uh, the presence of, uh, of cointegration is the following. If exists a cointegration, a linear combination vector, this one here, such that mu t, so this error here, becomes I zero, Okay, so basically, if my linear, there is a linear combination in such a way that my mu t becomes I zero, so becomes stationary, then this linear combination, guys, has a special name. It's called cointegration vector. And why is called cointegration vector? Because if we have I zero here and we have a cointegration vector, so this implies that there is, so remember, this sign is, exists. Uh, a long-term relationship between 
the variables. Well, in this case, between y, x1, t, with t, x1, t, and x2, t. Got it? So the way in which we prove in, this, in econometrics that there is a long-term relationship between variables is simply observing this. Of course, I, I, this is the, the linear version, the univariate version of the model, but the intuition is very simple. If I have series that are all integrated, and I find a linear combination, basically I find coefficients, beta zero, beta one, beta two, in such a way that the resulting error is I zero, then this, this uh, linear combination vector is named now co-integrating ve uh, co integration vector, okay? Co-integration vector, what, which implies necessarily guys that we have a long-term relationship between the variables that we have been analyzing, y, x1, t, x2, t, et cetera, okay? And, and so this is, this is crucial and this is beautiful because you're gonna see in, 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 in one minute what, what is the implication of this? Uh, okay, so how do we use this intuition? Okay, you know what? I know that I've been able to create this one here. I know that UT is stationary. However, before I said, yes, it's stationary, etc. Now, question, you know, how do I prove? You know, basically, how do you prove? that ut uh, is i zero. Well, by intuition, guys, we know already this one here. So what we can do is we run this regression, okay? I will, I will explain more the steps later. And then I simply take the errors and then I analyze if, if they are i zero, okay? Here we need to be very careful, guys, because now, remember when we were having the, the aumented Dicky fueler Dicky fueler we apply these tests on, on, on the data, agree? But in this case, mu t is created, is data created by a model. So it is most, it's more likely, or it's, it's very likely that you have here model errors, okay? They're going to be basically perturbing your, your normal tests, okay? But in any case, this is gonna be for, uh, we're not going to cover the details of this, but in this class, if you are able to basically understand that you can do an, uh, an ADF to the errors and check if they are zero, if they are zero, you, you can argue that they are, they are co-integrated. So there is a long-term relationship. So that's gonna be enough, but there are more techniques. There are more, more issues that we need to consider in time when we have this type of analysis for I zero of the errors. Okay, just please pay attention to that. Okay, so how do I use this then? Okay, I, I, I know that co-integration exists and how do I implement this in my model? In, in a model, how do I create a model that has a long-term memory, that has a long-term equilibrium? That, that's the main question here. Okay, so let's start with a very simple short-term memory model. Uh, let's assume that yt, x1, t, uh, let's assume only, only these two guys. Uh, let's assume that this one here is an integrated of degree one, and let's assume that this one here is integrated of degree one. So this implies non-stationary. So you have done your test, your, your ADF, uh, and based on your day, ADF, they are non-stationary, and you know that they are I1. So you just take the difference one, once, and then you obtain an I0, okay? And then you say, you know what? Uh, I just want to model my short-term relationship. So I take the first difference, and this is going to be, this is going to be an okay equation. But you remember, when you have series and differences, you don't have a long-term memory. Okay, so you are only short-term modeling. You're modeling the short-term. So how do you do that? How do you in, in, in implement a long-term memory? And that model is called the error correction model. So what is the error correction model? Extremely intuitive. Okay, so I have my original data. Oh, I forgot here my beta one, of course, it, my coefficient. Beta one change of xt up to here, short term. And what I will do, guys, is I will add a new variable, beta two. And I will add this component here. Okay, so take a look to, first of all, we are using t minus one and t minus one. Okay, and second of all, take a look to what happens here. So I don't have the change. These are variables in levels. 
Okay, so this one here, guys, if you realize what is this, this comes from a model that was saying yt minus one equals gamma xt minus one plus an error bt, correct? So yt minus one minus gamma xt minus one equals bt. So remember this, this looks very similar. This looks very similar to, to this equation here, right? So what I'm interested, oh, what, what I am interested is to show, is to, to verify that this one here is, is I zero. So the question, the relevant question is here. Is it I zero? So is it stationary? Okay. If yes, if yes, guys, this implies that you have a long-term relationship and this implies that your vector one comma minus gamma is your co-integrating vector, co-integrating vector, co-integration co -integration relationship is, is the same. And then you can use this model because take a look, if this is true, so I'm, I'm in this case, if yes, this is I zero, this is I zero, and also this part here is an I zero. So you can use the simple uh, OLS techniques or, or uh, maximal likelihood techniques that you have used. So this is going to be completely, completely okay. As soon as this is I zero, you can do this. Now, what happens if you have a, a no? You know what? There is no linear relationship here. There is, sorry, no, there is no uh, a quantitative vector that makes this I zero. So in that case, guys, this implies simply there is no relationship, there is no long-term relationship. So, and what is the best model when you don't have a long-term uh, relationship? Well, you go back to the original. So this one here, you see? So it is very interesting. It's very easy to understand. It's very simple to apply. And of course it has issues that we're going to discuss today. And we're going to do the, the EVs in class and we're going to do multivariate version also in class. What is the main problem with this one here? Okay, so first of all, take a look to the, to the process. Let's take a, let's think about the process. So what you do in terms of process guys is first, let's call this I, uh, perhaps in a bit. Yeah, let's, let's call this Roman one. The first step is run regression presented in one. Okay, at this point, you don't care about the coefficients. You don't care about beta one, beta two, beta nothing. You simply run, and what you do from here is capture the residuals. So capture this one here. Once you capture these residuals, guys, what you do is test for uh, stationarity, for non-stationarity. So as I mentioned to you guys, at this point in this class, let's use ADF. Yeah, there are some more techniques that help better control for the errors coming from the model. Run the, the ADF, and if, if this one here is an I0, so if my error is an I0, so the next step is really interpret the, interpret the, interpret the coefficients. So now you can start interpreting the coefficients. Okay? Uh, if not, So simply go back to your short-term memory model. Short-term model. You understand? It's, it's, it's very straightforward. Now, uh, what I'm forgetting here. So you run, you have this one here. Oh yeah, so gamma. So you, you know that my co-integration relationship is going to be the sign. If you move the, the X, if you move the X to the other side, close to the Y is going to be negative. So it's going to be my co-integration relationship is going to be one minus gamma. This one here is called the speed of adjustment. Of adjustments of what? So remember guys that when we analyze short-term, short-term, there are always going to be discrepancies, okay? It's very tricky to find something that has no discrepancy in short-term. So these discrepancies, what we're doing here is we're trying to fix them. So that's why it's called error correction. So we observe what happened in T minus one, and then we try to correct that and try to improve the model. That's what we do. Okay, how fast the correction happens? Well, it depends on, B in, on beta two. 
the, the, the stronger this beta two, the, the stronger the correction. The smaller the beta two, the longer the period of time in which the correction is incorporated in the short term. Make sense? So with this one here, you have the, the, the first model. By the way, the first model is called the two-step model, two-step. This model here is called the two-step angle granger model. Okay, and, and of course, it's very intuitive, it's very easy to, to understand, very easy to implement. However, it has a very, very significant issue. So what is the problem? Problem. As you can see here, I have been working with two variables. Okay. So if I have, if we have K variables, Okay, let's, let's assume first two variables, like, like we have here in this example. I have y and I have x1, t. How many cointegrating co -integrating relationships I can find? Well, I can find cointegration relationships that I can find are equal to one, like, like in this process here. Okay, so that's perfect. However, what if I have, or we have K variables? Okay, so this implies that I have yt, x1t, x2t, x 3 xkt. So I have tons of variables. How many cointegration relationships I can find? The number of cointegration relationships, guys, that I will call R is always going to be a, less or equal than k minus one, All right? So if, example, let's assume only k equals four. So r could be smaller or equal than four minus one. So r is going to be smaller or equal than three, All right? So how my, my variable, my equation is going to look when I have k, uh, four variables? Well, my equation is going to look like yt equals beta zero plus beta one x one t plus beta two x two t plus beta three x three t plus beta four x four t plus my error, you agree? So now if we follow this technique, okay, we can create, a, so this one here is the part that goes here, a last one period, but how many different beta zero, beta one, beta two, beta three I can run? If you just run simple OLS, how many different coefficients you can have if you use the same data? Well, your, your co-integrating vector is going to be, if I move all the x's and the, the intercept to the other side, my co my co-integration vector is always going to be one minus beta zero minus beta one minus beta two minus beta three minus beta four, do you agree? So there is no way that if you run 10 times that the simple OLS with the, that with the same model and the same data, there is no way in which this beta, this, this cointegration or this uh, vector of linear relationship can, can change. There is no way. And that's precisely, guys, the main problem. So how do I create three cointegration relationships if I have a model that can only create one by construction? So this is the main problem here. And that's the problem that we're gonna be solving in next class with vector error correction models. Uh, the Johansen test, we're going to talk about all this stuff and we're going to do uh, one simple and integrated example that is going to show how we go with a univariate back model, a uh, error correction model to a back model passing through the Johansen test, etc. Okay, so I think that this is something that you need to study uh, for next class to be prepared for next class. And next class, we're going to do, run with this part and start working with a vector error correction model, etc. Okay, guys, uh, thank you very much for your attention and talk soon. Bye-bye.